welcome. Hello, welcome. I am Sherry Porath Rockwell, and I am a privacy and cybersecurity lawyer at Sidley Austin in Century City. And I'm here today in my capacity as the chair of the California Lawyers Association's Privacy Law Section. Um, we are thrilled to present this webinar series with the Future of Privacy Forum. And the series is entitled CPRA Law and Tech. And the goal is to explore the technologies in a lawyer-friendly way um, that underlie CPRA and that are mentioned in CPRA. And today we're going to, we, we, we are honored to have Jennifer Urban, the chair of the California Privacy Protection Agency with us. Um, and she's going to be speaking to us for a bit. And then we'll be joined um, by Juwan Serrato and Keir Lamont. And they will um, take you through CPRA and highlighting those areas where technology is discussed. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy Gray right now, and she's gonna tell you about the, the deeper dive sessions that we have planned for the next five or six Fridays um, at the same time uh, to, to discuss the technologies. Stacy, over to you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, my name is Stacy Gray, and I'm the Director of Legislative Research and Analysis at the Future of Privacy Forum. We are a global nonprofit organization dedicated to consumer privacy and informed public policy. And we're very excited to be running this series with the California Lawyers Association on technology and law. We're gonna be hosting these sessions every Friday for the next couple of months. You can see all of them and register for any or all of them at fpf.org slash events. And specifically, what we're really interested in is less teaching you the law or the policy or weighing in on law and policy, but bringing in academic and technical and sometimes business experts to share their expertise on how the tech works, how the tech side works. So we're thinking of this informally as kind of tech for lawyers. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the CPRA and other emerging laws. But for every following session, uh, each Friday between now and April 1st, we will actually not be focusing on the law uh, as much at all. We'll be focusing on the technology. And specifically, you can join us for uh, informational webinars on what sensitive data looks like, what that means. We're gonna be doing an introduction to online and mobile advertising because we know that is at the heart of a lot of emerging legislation. We're gonna be having a session on dark patterns and manipulative design uh, with an expert there to, to help us think about what dark patterns are. Um, and uh, we will also be holding um, a second webinar also around online advertising, but specifically diving a little bit deeper into universal opt-outs, uh, browser settings, global privacy controls, and everything in that world, again, with an eye not towards how the law applies, but towards how the technology works. Um, and we may add more. Uh, automated decision-making is also a, a very interesting topic that there, there's a lot of technological um, understanding that's lacking and, uh, and we're open to more ideas. So if there's a particular tech topic that you're interested in, shoot me a message, shoot Sherry a message and uh, we'll, we'll think about adding it. So very excited. Again, register at fpf.org slash events. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it back back to you, Sherry. Great, thanks so much, Stacy. Um, yeah, so we are uh, we are we're just so excited to bring this to you, um, and think it's so important, and and it's going to help us all as we wade through rulemaking, and also help our clients or, or try to understand it for ourselves. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I am the chair of the California Lawyers Association. And I didn't really explain what that is for those of you who don't know. It's basically the State Bar Association for California lawyers, open to all lawyers. Um, and we are a new section of the of California Lawyers Association, relatively new. And Jiwan, who's on the screen, helped um, helped form the section. And we, we welcome everybody who would like to join us. Um, we have a lot of interesting things going on and, and this is something we're so proud of. 
So um, without further ado, we will kick it off. As I mentioned earlier, we're joined by Jiwan Serrato, um, um, who's a partner at Baker Hotstetler, and Kier Lamont, who is senior counsel at um, the Future of Privacy Forum. All right, so now I'm gonna turn to um, talking with Jennifer Urban, again, the chair of the board of the California Privacy Protection Agency. Um, so Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it on the heels of your big um, meeting yesterday. I'm sure that <laughs> uh, took a lot of your time. Um, but yeah, so we're just gonna, we're gonna talk to you um, just to kind of do a high level overview for those who may not, uh, may not know. Um, kind of initially, what, what is the, the agency's role in rulemaking? And just at a high level, and if you can just flag for some ways in which um, it is different than the rulemaking that we all experienced under CCPA, when the AG with the California Attorney General's office was in charge of rulemaking. Thank you so much, Sherry, and thank you for having me. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, as I uh, may say a little bit more later, I am very supportive of the mission of this series of events uh, to connect lawyers with the technology and the technological questions underlying the relevant law. So I'm, I'm just really pleased to be here. I do need to say um, at the outset that I do not speak for the board of the California Privacy Protection Agency or the agency, only for myself. Um, I need to give that disclaimer, which will not be unfamiliar to all of the lawyers in the room, but it is important that we're clear about that. Um, and thank you for the, for the question, um, Sherry. So um, I think that uh, people are pretty familiar with the general um, uh, fact of the agency um, having the responsibility to do a round of rulemaking under the CCPA, which is now amended by the CPRA, which created the agency. Um, but there are a couple of points that might be helpful um, for people to understand. Uh, the way the law is constructed, the Attorney General had rulemaking authority for the CCPA um, and then when the CPRA amended the CCPA, there was provision to create the agency that I'm the um, chair of the board for, and then for the agency to have rulemaking authority transferred to it. Um, so we had to give notice to the attorney general um, so that we have a careful um, sequence of events, which we did, and our rulemaking authority will transfer to us in April. Um, once that happens, I know that I've had some questions about our rulemaking, rulemaking under the CPRA or the CCPA. So rulemaking authority under the CCPA, which is amended by the CPRA and remains the CCPA, transfers to us in April. Um, there are some differences, not in the, the uh, Administrative Procedures Act, formal rulemaking, um, uh, requirements that everybody is familiar with if they participate in the CCPA, but how those things operate um, when you have an agency with a board that is subject to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Um, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act in California means uh, requires for uh, all board deliberations to happen in a properly noticed public meeting. And the sort of preamble to Bagley Keene um, or its sort of purpose actually says that transparency is being chosen over efficiency in this um, scenario. So it's very important for transparency and for public participation. But what it means is that um, the board will be deliberating publicly um, on, for example, the draft rulemaking package and the board will have to decide publicly um, based on that deliberation to um, approve the rulemaking package to head into the formal rulemaking process to begin with. And that's not something you would see with the attorney general's office or with federal agencies, you know, they'll release a rulemaking package and they'll get going. Um, but there will be more public sort of discussion um, of our rulemaking package um, under Bagley Keene. So that is one difference that I think is not intuitive um, for a lot of folks who do a lot of federal rulemaking um, or were participating in the previous, um, the previous process. 
And my understanding, which was so surprising to me, is that there, there are five of you on the board, and yet you can't really talk with one another. Is that right? Or what are the constraints on you just um, convening and, and discussing an issue? Oh, yes, thank you for um, that. So that is also really counterintuitive to people. Um, we uh, can only discuss um, things when we have a quorum of the board, which is three people, um, in a properly noticed public meeting. Um, so that means that we cannot talk about um, the rules or other policy decisions that we need to make outside of one of those formal public meetings. Now, we can have subcommittees of two people to do substantive work that can then advise the board. And those of you who followed our process know that Lydia De La Torre and I were the regulation subcommittee and we proposed um, the board break into subject matter subcommittees to do some thinking and working on different subject matters under the regulation package that we need to put together. And we did that. So two people can do work and then come back to the board and say, this is what we recommend. So we are absolutely doing that. Um, but the, we have to stay within those, those groups of two people in order to be compliant with that leaking. Okay, and you do have a, the agency simultaneously, um, you're standing up an agency. The agency has an executive director, Ashkan Sultani, um, and you're, I, do, I don't think you've yet hired a general counsel, is that right? Um, we do have, uh, Ashkan Sultani is our executive director, yeah. and I think you were at the meeting yesterday and saw how like grateful and relieved the board is with him because the other thing is staff of course can work behind the scenes and he's been doing an amazing job of building the agency and helping us efficiently prepare for all of our substantive work. Um, so we also have an interim general counsel. Um, he is what's called a retired annuitant. Um, someone with a lot of experience, um, our wonderful interim general counsel, Brian Souble, used to be chief counsel at the California Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, he retired, um, and then um, you can come back in the status um, uh, to work, but you can't, it, he's half time. Um, so, um, so, but we do have um, strong advice there, and we have legal services from the uh, attorney general's office as well. Okay. Um, I, you know, I neglected to mention at the outset that this is being recorded. Um, Stacy has posted in the, um, in the chat um, to remind people of that fact, but I did want to articulate that so everybody's aware that we are recording this and, and we'll, we'll put it up so folks can view it, but, but you should know it's being recorded and also we'll circulate materials um, to those who are registered as well. And if, again, the Q and A, if you if you want to ask questions. So sorry about that. I just neglected to mention the recording. Okay. So then, um, all right. Well, for those of us and those of us who didn't attend yesterday's board meeting, there were dates. We finally we did get some dates, and I just wanted to walk through the rulemaking dates with you or estimated dates. Um, and I think it's helpful to divide it up into maybe two buckets. One is kind of the informal rulemaking process. And the other is the more formal rule, not the more, but the formal rule making process that we all know, you know, notice and comment. So I think, you know, obviously now we're in the informal process and um, Mr. Sultani mentioned um, March, mid to late March um, would be the beginning of um, presentations from experts. Um, can you just tell us a little more about that? Sure, and let me back up for just a second. Um, we, um, we can't adopt regulations formally until we have the authority. Um, and that is, so when we start the formal rulemaking process needs to come sort of mesh with that, but we can do preliminary information gathering. And for such a complex rulemaking, I personally think that's really important. So um, we've already had a written opportunity um, for comments, an invitation for comment. We got about 900 pages um, and those have been in my, again, personally, like I've just found it really helpful to digest those and thinking through um, the work on the regulations. In March and April, we'll be moving to other stages, which are still in the preliminary um, rulemaking process, so we won't have entered the formal, very strict 
procedural process yet. Um, first, as you mentioned, Sherry, uh, we will have expert um, informational hearings uh, to provide background um, to the board and also to the public. So one of the things that um, Bagley Keene dictates is if you have three board members, you have a public meeting. So that's one reason the public had to listen to our board training yesterday. Um, I hope it wasn't too boring. Um, some people were probably interested. It was overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, but in this case, I think, you know, we probably would have done that anyway. Um, because it's informative for the public just as much as it is for us um, to have experts um, uh, help us understand some of the um, technical and uh, other complicated issues. So that is in March, and um, I hope people will look out for notices for those because everyone's welcome. Um, and then in April, um, uh, uh, God willing, and the creeks don't rise, as they say where I, where I grew up, um, um, we will have um, stakeholder uh, informational um, sessions. So that again, it's not part of, it's not that formal hearing that might be part, but an opportunity for stakeholders to give input um, in a, a sort of an informational hearing kind of format rather than in writing. And I would ask that people keep an eye out on our website um, for opportunities um, to request to be a part of that as well. Okay, and as a stakeholder, um, what other opportunities, if any, exist to communicate concerns uh, with, with the board or with the staff? Uh, well, I mean, stakeholders can certainly um, reach out. Um, the stakeholder um, roundtables will be a really good organized way to do that. Um, when we have public meetings, we always take public comment, and I value um, hearing questions and comments from the public. Uh, we aren't able usually to respond substantively at that time, but I promise we're listening. Um, so that's a really helpful way to participate as well. Um, and uh, in general, just kind of keeping an eye out, we'll, we want to be sure that we're being as accessible as possible. So um, uh, with the stakeholder hearings, for example, informational hearings, there will be like information on the website that everybody can access about that. Okay, great. And then moving moving through the year, um, I think I heard that Q2 is the estimated date for initial draft regulations. Is did it? Is that your understanding? Yes, and this is a this is um, a nice place I think to. Uh, draw a comparison between the process that people might have experienced with the Attorney General and, and our process under Bagley Keene. So we anticipate having the rulemaking package um, in Q2. Uh, the board will need to deliberate on the package to decide to put it into the formal rulemaking process. Um, so, and it's, the board may say yes, the board may say, staff, please make some changes. Um, and it's possible that the board would say, we want you to do more work on this and come back. So I do wanna be clear that there could be some discussion each with a 10 day notice um, before a public meeting, um, but that also means that the public sees that package before it goes into the formal rulemaking process under Bagley King. So that's anticipated for Q2. And then um, once it's, the board says it's ready, it'll go into the formal rulemaking process, uh, which is that 45 day um, process with the formal comment. Okay, and we saw with CCPA, there were several rounds of that process. Um, and so it, I think he said he's anticipating Q3 or Q4, the process would be finally concluded. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I, mean, I think Mr. Sultani was um, was with that Q3 or Q4 was anticipating if there was a need for another one of the 15 day additions, for example, that the AG did. You don't always need to do those. It kind of just depends on um, how public comment um, plays out and the agency's um, decisions on how to respond to that. Okay, I know we, we, we all know that you have a lot to do and a lot of ground to cover. Um, so hopefully, you know, we're, we're putting on these series to hopefully, you know, you all can tune in as well to hear uh, what, what the experts we've put together are saying about the different, different uh, technologies at the heart of the law. Um, so inevitably, you know, those of us practicing in the area 
um, we were telling our clients initially, oh, regs will come mid 2022, and now that's going to be later. So the question is, um, is the board thinking about delaying enforcement? Um, you know, what what can companies do when when this is all so unclear? So one important thing, and I, I know I say this a lot, and I don't mean to be um, too obvious, is, is to be sure, please, to participate um, in the public comment around the regulations. Um, with regards to enforcement, um, uh, uh, I've had questions from people about, for example, delaying the enforcement um, deadline in our November meeting, possibly in our October meeting, the board anticipated um, this possibility. Um, what the message that I would like to give um, to everyone today, and again, I can only speak for myself, um, is that we understand. I understand. I have heard, and um, I, I, I understand. And we uh, are limited in our ability to informally say that we are going to take one approach or another. Um, because in California, um, unlike in some other jurisdictions, that kind of guidance might be considered what's called an underground regulation that would actually need to go through the formal regulatory process. So um, with uh, the, again, the message that I really hear it, I do understand and would ask that people please understand that again, we're not trying to be unresponsive here. Um, we are um, operating within um, the limits that we must in order to um, fulfill California's transparency and public participation requirements um, and to, you know, please uh, continue to sort of let us know and we, we're, we're listening, I'm listening <laughs> and thinking about it. Okay, that's great. All right, well, um, you heard what we're doing here today. Um, you know, we're, 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 or not what we're doing today, but what, what the series is intended to focus on, which is really explaining the technologies um, that CPRA and other state data privacy laws popping up everywhere. Um, you know, those technologies that they're addressing and that they're regulating. Um, so would just love your thoughts about um, why, why should lawyers care about this? Why should they tune in? <laughs> well, I suspect the people who tuned in um, already recognize the importance of it, but I'm glad that this is being recorded as well. And again, I was really delighted to be asked to do this because it's one of the um, longstanding, my longstanding goals as a lawyer and in, in my other life as a professor at UC Berkeley is to try to um, establish connections between lawyers and technologists. Um, and when I'm working with my students to both persuade them of how important it is to understand the technology and the business models they're working with from a legal perspective and to gain comfort in talking with technologists and other experts who can help them understand those, um, those unfamiliar topics. Um, those of us who work in technology law, IP, privacy, um, uh, general sort of internet law know that as the tech changes, the law can become misaligned or unaligned with the way the technology is working in ways that the technologists, of course, didn't necessarily anticipate. And when lawyers are creating law and policy and trying to apply it um, it's, it, it can, they can get it wrong. Um, uh, I, my favorite example, of, of course, too complicated for 15 minutes, but people might be familiar, probably are familiar with it in this group, which is ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which you know, was written in 1986. And in that world, email was, uh, was uh, operated in a completely different way, technically than the way it operates today. And the law built that in, it sort of baked in this idea of how email was going to work and whose server it was gonna sit on. Um, uh, and it quickly became outpaced and, and very difficult to work with. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about the CCPA and the amendments from the CPRA is that it explicitly um, anticipates technological change. So for example, in section 1798.185A1, just the first you will regulate on this, and the second one and others, 
you know, it says to update the categories of personal information or sensitive information and part of and one of the reasons given is if the technology changes. So I really do appreciate that that's built in that assumption. Um, and the assumption that the agency will have the responsibility to keep track um, because there just isn't any way for us all to work together and um, make the, um, the technology and the business models consumer friendly the way consumers have asked us at the CPRA while understanding what that means for technological design and the business models without um, doing our best to understand the technology behind it. So I just think this is one of the most important things that a lawyer in this space can do. And I'm really glad that um, CLA and FPF are doing this series. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And um, we'll look forward to, to, seeing, to seeing you more in the months ahead uh, in, in board meetings. Wonderful. All right. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Jennifer. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it back over to Stacy, and um, she's going to introduce the next part of our program. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you so much to Chair Urban for, for joining and for that excellent conversation. It's time now to turn to a presentation uh, from two guest experts who are going to walk us through the California Privacy Rights Act in the context of other emerging legislation. So as we've said, most of this series, which we'll be holding each Friday, will be focused on the technology and the business models and the data flows. Today, we're going to start off that conversation by talking about the law, because we have specifically chosen five or six specific topics that are, we think, central to the new emerging privacy legislation in the United States, as you're gonna see. So I'll welcome uh, Juwan and Kier now to join me on screen and we'll have slides up in just a second. And before we begin, begin I'll just briefly introduce them. Juwan Serrato is the co-lead of the Digital Transformation and Data Economy Team, San Francisco leader of the Digital Assets and Data Management Group and co-lead of the US Consumer Privacy Practice at Baker Hosteller. Um, Juwan formerly served on the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Data Privacy and Integrity Advisory Committee. She was also the inaugural chair of the California Lawyers Association's Privacy Law Section Executive Committee. Um, so in, in addition to also in a previous role being a chief privacy officer for a major financial institution. So really, really amazing to have you here, Juwan. Welcome. And Kier Lamont. Kier is a... Um, Senior Counsel at the Future of Privacy Forum on our US federal and state legislation team. Uh, in addition to, to being a friend and colleague, here has nearly seven years of significant consumer privacy tech policy experience. And in his current role, he supports policymaker education and independent analysis concerning the federal, state, and local consumer privacy laws and regulations. So. Uh, time to talk about CPRA and emerging legislation. I'm going to pull the slides up and I'll just uh, welcome everybody again to please put questions into the Q&A and we will either address them live or address them at the end. We've got 15 minutes set aside for questions and discussion. Thank you, Stacey. While we have the slides coming up, uh, we'll just provide a little bit of a um, agenda in terms of how we're going to spend the next 30 minutes. Um, and then we're going to open up for questions, uh, as Stacy said. Uh, so the first slide, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of a background of uh, what, how fragmented the US privacy landscape is. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, we are talking about CPRA, but we also wanted to uh, give you the background uh, that first of all, CPRA amends the CCPA and CCPA is definitely not the first California law. There are over 150 privacy laws in California already in the books. And following the heels of CCPA, now we have Virginia and Colorado and probably about 15 different states who are passing or considering uh, CCPA-like laws. So it really is a fragmented landscape in terms in terms of thinking about the US privacy law um, and, and emerging issues related to technology. So we're going to be talking about 
um, Kier is going to focus on the CPRA, and then I will follow up with a comparison of the CPRA to the VCDPA and the and to the CPA. And hopefully, if we have time at the end, uh, I'm going to try to mention some examples of the California AG enforcement uh, cases, uh, because some of these uh, topics, the technologies that we're going to be talking about, have already been under enforcement under the CCPA. And um, as we know, uh, with CPRA rulemaking, it will put, uh, potentially have additional rights and additional obligations for the businesses. To the extent that uh, thinking about the California AG enf uh, enforcements are helpful, um, we are going to um, hopefully cover that. And if we don't have time at the end, uh, maybe we can do a separate uh, panel on just uh, CCPA enforcement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to th the first question that we often get when we're talking about this, this emerging landscape is uh, which law applies to me, uh, to our organization? So uh, we provided here a slide. Um, and just to kind of let you know, the slides are going to be available at the end of the session. Uh, so uh, if we're not reading every word that's on the slide, um, these are really meant to be takeaways for you. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out, you know, does CPA apply to me or does Virginia or Colorado apply to me, the applicability and the threshold question is probably the first question you want to ask in terms of um, whether your organization meets the threshold. Uh, what's interesting here is that CPRA, as did CCPA has the revenue threshold, uh, whereas the other states have the processing and the sale of personal information as a threshold question. For those of you that are working in a global organization, these threshold questions are not the same as the threshold questions that we got from GDPR. GDPR does not have, you know, for example, the revenue or the processing uh, number threshold. So what's interesting is to note that the U.S. privacy laws are taking a little bit of a different uh, take in terms of how to think about the privacy laws laws applicability and threshold. Next question, my next slide. Exemptions. The next question that we get after uh, whether this applies to me or not is, are there some exemptions? Um, again, kind of showing you how fragmented it is. In the United States, we currently do not have one data protection law that covers all industries. We have uh, laws that apply to pretty much every industry. So we've listed here for you, again, as a takeaway, financial services versus healthcare versus children's data. Um, all of those kind of different types of industry, different types of data are already regulated by federal and state laws. And so to the extent that those, in, those laws are already in place, CPRA, VCDPA, and C, uh, CPA already have some, but not all, not a complete uh, set of exemptions that are built in. So with that uh, fragmented uh, landscape, um, I think we're going to turn it over to Kier to do a deep dive on CPRA. Uh, thank you, Juwan, for that overview of the California Privacy Rights Act and recognition of the central role that California is playing in the overall U.S. privacy landscape. I would like to spend a few minutes discussing some of the operational implications of the CPRA to regulated businesses and also share some observations about anticipated next steps for implementing the CPRA in advance of its January 2023 effective date. In doing so, I'll highlight some of the key technologies that privacy professionals, professionals operationalizing the CPRA will have to consider, which will be explored in greater detail in future events of this CPRA tech and law series. The drafters of the CP, uh, California Privacy Rights Act ballot initiative made extensive changes to the underlying California Consumer Privacy Act that were designed to both strengthen and expand the rights and protections enjoyed by Californians. These changes include new and modified definitions, the adoption of new individual rights and controls, and finally, the creation of new responsibilities for businesses to process information in a fair and secure manner. Many of these changes will have significant technical implications for regulated businesses. For example, new definitions may require some companies to conduct more detailed mapping of the personal information that they collect, process, and retain. In addition, the creation of new individual rights will require changes to the user interfaces and mechanisms that businesses are providing for the exercise of privacy controls. And on the back end, businesses may need to adopt or restructure IT architecture in order to implement consumer requests concerning the use of personal data. Next slide, please. 
So I'll start first with some key definitions introduced by the CPRA. The original CCPA applied largely the same rights and protections to all personal data that was broadly defined as information that could reasonably be linked directly or indirectly with a particular consumer or household. The California Privacy Rights Act changes the game by establishing a new category of personal data, sensitive information, that is viewed as inherently higher risk and susceptible to greater harm if breached or misused, and is therefore subject to heightened protections. We'll get to new consumer rights later, but note that, that there are various subcategories of information here that have their own definitions within the CPRA. This includes categories such as precise geolocation information and biometric information. So organizations may need to do some analysis to determine whether a data set they hold contains sensitive information pursuant to the CPRA or not. Or perhaps their data would qualify as sensitive but is instead subject to an exception, such as for publicly available information. So be sure to tune back in for session two of this series, which is going to be all about understanding sensitive data, including health conditions, demographics, and when inferences made using data may be sensitive. Next slide, please. So one of the key controls established by the original CCPA was the creation of a right to opt out of the sale of personal information. However, the statutory language for this right generated significant debate over the extent to which it applies to the collection and use of consumer data to facilitate targeted advertising. This is a crucial question because concerns and criticism of targeted, interest-based, or surveillance advertisements depending on your preferred nomenclature, has been a driving factor in current efforts to enact comprehensive privacy legislation in both Congress and at state legislatures. The CPRA seeks to end this debate within California by defining and regulating cross-context behavioral advertising, as well as sharing data for targeted advertising. The new law clearly states that consumers' opt-out rights extend to these activities. However, the full technical and operational implications of these new terms are not yet fully clear. For example, what does it mean for a consumer to intentionally interact with websites or services in the context of the CPRA? This will be subject to future rulemaking. Elsewhere, the CPRA excludes certain advertising practices from these definitions, such as the placement of per non-personalized advertising based on a consumer's current interaction with a business, and certain measurements such as ad performance metrics. The ad tech ecosystem has a reputation as being an extremely complex environment. Fortunately, session three of the series will break down the basics of what privacy professionals should know about online advertising. Next slide, please. So I would like to discuss two additional definitions introduced in the CPRA with significant operational implications. The first is consent, which must be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. This is a strong standard that folks familiar with Europe's general data protection regulation will recognize. However, the CPRA gives additional instructions on design practices for obtaining legally valid consent, disclaiming, for example, pausing or muting a piece of content and consent obtained through the use of so-called dark patterns. Uh, UX specialist Harry Brignall coined the term dark patterns back in 2010 to describe a family of design features with the effect of tricking users into doing something. Dark patterns are separately defined in the CPRA to mean a user interface designed or manipulated with the substantial effect of subverting or impairing user autonomy, decision-making, or choice. The CPRA's definition has raised concerns from some industry stakeholders who argue that they lack clear standards and principles for evaluating whether design features would be considered as, for example, impairing autonomy in the CPRA context. However, this is another aspect of the CPRA that may be subject to additional rulemaking, and session four of the series will take an in-depth look at dark patterns and manipulative design. Finally, 
In addition to targeted advertising, another major concern driving efforts to enact privacy legislation is the potential for emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence or machine learning systems to create harmful or inequitable impacts to individuals and communities. The CPRA goes beyond the C CPA by directly entering the space and defines profiling, automated processing to evaluate, analyze, or make predictions about an individual. So, having discussed some of the key definitions introduced by the CPRA, I would like to turn to the individual privacy rights and controls that the Act creates. Next slide, please. So, this chart provides a very simplified overview of the primary individual consumer rights under both the original CCPA that have been in effect since January 2020 and the CPRA, which will go into effect in January 2023. Uh, organizations already subject to the CCPA will likely be well positioned to adjust to many aspects of the CPRA. However, new compliance processes and changes to system architecture may nevertheless be required to operationalize new and expanded consumer privacy rights. The CCPA's core consumer rights included the ability for individuals to access and delete personal information and receive their data in a read readily portable format. While these rights will largely carry over into the new CPRA, there have been some modifications that regulated businesses should be aware of. For example, under the CPRA, the consumer right to access personal information will expand to include data collected beyond the previous 12 months, unless providing such information would involve disproportionate effort. The CPRA also creates a new consumer right to correct inaccurate personal information. Like all of these rights, this is not absolute, and the Act directs businesses and regulators to account for the nature and the purposes of processing the personal information, while also directing the use of commercially reasonable efforts to make corrections. Uh, next, uh, as addressed in the discussion of key definitions, under the CPRA, the consumer right to opt out of the sale of data will expand to sharing of data. Businesses will likely want to reassess their data transfers to determine whether they will be impacted by the broader scope of this right. And next, uh, and perhaps the most significant new consumer right in the CPRA, is the creation of a right for consumers to, at any time, direct a business to limit its use of the consumer's sensitive personal information to what is reasonably necessary to perform the services or provide the goods reasonably expected in by an average consumer. However, there are also some exceptions for beneficial types of processing for purposes such as debugging and for fraud pre prevention. And uh, finally, the CPRA will specifically apply consumer rights in the context of automated decision-making technology and profiling. Uh, however, many of the details for the scope and exercise of these rights uh, are left to agency rulemaking, which I will return to momentarily. Uh, next slide, please. So, in addition to a new set of consumer rights that businesses will be required to implement, the CPRA also creates and modifies affirmative obligations on companies in order to pr promote fair and safe processing of consumers' data. Uh, we don't have time to discuss these in any great detail, but some of the key obligations that businesses should be aware of are, are one, uh, businesses will be required to conduct and submit risk assessments for certain inherently risky activities. Uh, two, the CPRA includes a new data minimization standard, providing that a business shall not retain personal information for longer than is reasonably necessary for its disclosed purposes. And three, in many cases under the CPRA, uh, consumers' rights will travel with their data to downstream downstream recipients. This carries significant implications for the negotiation of contracts between businesses, and organizations will need to determine whether they are acting as a business, a service provider, or a contractor pursuant to the CPRA, and ensure that they have both the necessary contractual provisions in place and are able to fulfill their specific obligations under the CPRA. So, while this is a broad set of rules, of uh, new duties, uh, in many cases, a common first step in compliance efforts will be the completion of a data mapping process in order to fully understand what data is collected, how it is used, and when it is shared and deleted. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as you heard from Chairperson Urban earlier in this uh, panel, uh, at the, the CPRA provided for the creation of the California Privacy Protection Agency, or CPPA, and grants broad authority to the CPPA to promulgate and update implementing privacy regulations. Uh, the CPPA has already taken a first step in this process, issuing an invitation for public comment in September of last year, which received almost 900 pages of input from over 70 organizations and individuals. And as we have heard uh, just, yesterday, uh, just yesterday, the uh, executive director of the agency shared that the aim for is to begin formal rulemaking procedures in Q2 and conclude them in either Q3 or quarter four of this year. Uh, while this means that regulations will be completed after the July 1st date envisioned by the CPRA, the board agreed that it is appropriate to receive broad stakeholder input prior to issuing implementing regs. However, based solely on public information, including the request for comments and stakeholder input, I would like to highlight two important tech-focused areas of the CPRA which may undergo operationally significant rulemaking. Next slide, please. So first, uh, many stakeholders in the privacy community have uh, long expressed concern that leading privacy frameworks rely too heavily on individual controls and consent options that are overwhelming and unscalable for ordinary consumers in practice. One response to this criticism has been the development and legal recognition of user-selected opt-out opt -out preference signals, often exercised through browser settings or plugins that automatically signal an individual's request to exercise their privacy rights to the websites they visit. Uh, this is not a new issue in California. And in fact, the California Attorney General's FAQ page for this uh, existing CCPA states that one such signal called the Global Privacy Control or GPC must be honored by covered businesses as a valid consumer request to stop the sale of personal information. Uh, however, recent public comments to the CPPA revealed significant divergences in statutory interpretation between stakeholders as to whether business recognition of this class of opt-out signals is required under the CPRA. For example, Comments from multiple industry groups argued that the text of the CPRA clarifies that it is optional for a business to recognize opt-out signals. On the other hand, uh, Californians for Consumer Privacy, the organization that drafted the CPRA ballot initiative, argued that there is no reading of the statute that would allow a business to refuse to honor a global opt-out signal enabled by a consumer and called it categorically untrue that the CPRA makes honoring an opt-out button optional. However, no matter the ultimate outcome of this question, it is clear that the use of technological signals for exercising consumer choice is going to be a fixture of the US privacy conversation going forwards. Furthermore, by virtue of its rulemaking authority, the CPPA is poised to play a defining role in establishing the technical specifications and standards for this emerging class of privacy controls. Session five of the series will feature experts who will provide a lawyer-friendly explanation of how such signals work and summarize what website operators should know in order to implement these technologies. Next slide, please. And in its request for comments, the agency also posed several questions about how to issue regulations applying consumer access and opt-out rights to automated decision-making technologies. Public comments again revealed significant areas of disagreement, including over the scope of decision-making technologies that should be regulated and the application of consumer rights to these technologies. For starters, numerous commenters recommended that the agency define the scope of regulated decisions to those that produce legal or similarly significant effects to consumers, noting a similar standard uh, under the GDPR. This standard would include, for example, automatic refusal of an online credit application, decisions made by online job recruitment platforms, and decisions that affect other financial, employment, health, or educational opportunities. Several industry groups further sought to ensure that the regulations will govern only fully automated processes that produce final decisions. 
supporting their analysis, many commenters pointed to a universe of clearly low risk, socially beneficial tools such as calculators, spreadsheets, GPS systems, and spell checkers that could be swept up by overly broad regulation in this space. However, many civil society groups offering comments took a different approach, arguing that given growing concerns around algorithmic harm and bias, the agency's regulations should cast a wider net and include, for example, systems that provide recommendations, support a decision, or contextualize information. Stakeholders also disagreed on how opt-out rights should apply to automated decision-making systems. For example, Californians for Consumer Privacy wrote that the agency should specify that consumers have the right to opt out of automated decision making in the context of online advertising, but that the agency should subsequently expand the right to other areas of online and business activity. In contrast, two trade associations provided comments arguing that uh, since the CPRA does not provide an express right to opt out of automated decision making generally, the creation of any opt out right beyond existing rights involving sales, sharing and sensitive data would be unconstitutional. These are important issues and a later soon to be announced session of this series will break down the basics of artificial intelligence and machine learning for attorneys. So that was my best attempt at giving you a high level overview of the key changes introduced by the CPRA and their operational impacts. I would now like to turn it back to G1, who will spend some time discussing how the CPRA aligns, and in some cases doesn't, with other US privacy laws. Thank you, Kier. Next slide, please. So as Kier said, there are several uh, parts of the CPRA that really does impact uh, the use of the technologies and uh, it really you know, gives the, the CPPA, the new agency uh, center of authority to promulgate uh, rules um, in terms of regulations and how uh, these te technologies will continue to be regulated. If you're taking a look at now how to put together a compliance program for CPRA, um, a lot of organizations are really trying to harmonize and to think about uh, whether the kinds of controls that you might want to have in place for CPRA can be used for Virginia and Colorado as well. Uh, so um, we are providing here some, again, some takeaway. The, the term is personal information or personal data, and the definition of each of those are, are different. The sensitive data is also different. And so there are some commonalities in terms of how we think about personal data and the scope of what it means, let's say, to use a personal information for advertising purposes, or what it means uh, to, um, to have global opt-out from sensitive personal data. It's going to be uh, different differently applied slightly in each of these laws. If you can go to next slide, please. Uh, we've provided here a list of what we would consider to be sensitive data under these three laws. Um, as uh, Chairperson Urban said, the definition of personal information and sensitive data is an area that we do expect certain uh, regulations. So we need to keep monitoring to make sure that there are no changes uh, that are contemplated. But for now, this is uh, the example. There's the categories of data that is considered sensitive data. Now, when uh, we do the data mapping, as Kier um, mentioned, to identify the processing activities that would fall under uh, the sensitive data regulations, it is important to note uh, that there, this is not a traditional way of how we thought about sensitive data. It is not the same definition of sensitive data under GDPR, and it's not the same way that we might have thought about under other US privacy laws, such, such as, let's say, social security number or, or credit card number. So for the the technologists and an IT specialists that are working side by side with privacy lawyers, I think the one thing that really uh, we need to um, emphasize um, is to know that uh, when we are talking about implementing these privacy regulations under CPRA, VCDPA, or CPA, that data tagging is really where we need to start. If you don't have the IT mechanisms to identify the data that has just, just greatly expanded. The definition of personal data and definition of data is, is new. This is not the way that organizations have been handling and have been processing some of the controls. And so uh, really need to start first with 
what data do we care about and how do these laws change the way that we thought about data previously? Because again, the definition is so broad and different kinds of categories of data that never were regulated before will now be regulated. If you're thinking about opt-out uh, from sale or from share or to limit the use of sensitive data, which is gonna be in place by the CPRA, again, uh, we're going to have to uh, put together uh, the data mapping and the architecture uh, to realize where the data is ingested, how it moves to the organization and where it goes. So that full architecture uh, and the data flow maps in terms of applying the privacy requirements are going to be crucial. If you don't know how the data is ingested and uh, to whom it is shared and for what purpose it is used, then we're not gonna be able to find implementation mechanisms for each of these new rights and obligations as Kier outlined. Next slide, please. So we're going to provide here again, a couple of comparison points for what it means to process data and what it means to sell um, across the three laws. Uh, you'll see here again that there are some commonalities but slight differences between the three laws. What is impor important is the word processing, again, is very broad. So if we're thinking about um, how these new rights apply, the, the fact that the word processing is so broad means that we're not just talking about um, we're, the, the number of business processing activities that are in scope for applying these opt-out rights, for applying uh, these uh, consumer rights in terms of access to deletion and opt-out will be greatly expanded. So if you're th thinking about uh, data uh, that has been ingested, and uh, whether that is being accessed or whether that is being stored or archived, is it de-identified, is it not? Uh, really, there is a, a significant amount of IT controls that the privacy lawyers need to think about to think of and to identify specifically which activities are we going to say are in scope for each of these laws um, and which ones are out of scope. And that's why we started in the beginning of the, the session to think about the exemptions. Let's go to the next slide, please. So Kier talked about uh, the CPRA regulations that we are anticipating in terms of the automated decision-making and the opt-out uh, questions. Uh, what we want to highlight here is that these concepts, you know, still are going to be uh, shared in the other laws. So if you're thinking about putting together a compliance program uh, that is going to work um, across the nation um, and to perhaps anticipate some of the changes that are coming in the other state laws, it is important to take a look at how uh, these terms are defined and again, identifying which activities would fall under um, these definitions in terms of targeted advertising, dark patterns and profiling. If you take a look at the CPRA itself, it's, in, it's interesting to note that uh, the word profiling, automated decision making, only, uh, only appears four times. And there are no specific access rights that's tied to profiling and automated decision making in the CPRA itself. However, where we do see certain discussions about access rights and the algorithms behind the profiling automated decision making is in the regulations. So it is, um, it is as we started this session talking and listening to Chairperson Urban, um, there is a lot to be said uh, because the CPRA law itself does not provide the rights but the regs will potentially expand uh, the questions that the businesses would need to contemplate in terms of access rights to the algorithms uh, behind how these technologies work. Now, there is some case law um, that is uh, that we have right now that talks about uh, the algorithms uh, behind uh, some of the decisions that uh, the companies make, and they are potentially protected as trade secret. So uh, we are watching closely to, to see to what extent these access rights are behind the algorithm, behind the technology, and to show how these technologies work will be under, regulated, under regulations by the CPPA. Also, as Kier mentioned, uh, to, to think about the opt-out and the targeted advertising, 
Um, it, is, it is not a new issue. Um, the, the fact that global privacy control uh, was deemed to be required under CCPA, I think that did uh, surprise uh, quite a few folks, um, but uh, we have we are currently defending a number of companies that have received notice of violations from the California AG on that particular topic. So again, it's not in the CCPA, it's not in the statute itself in terms of requirement to respond to global privacy control. It's in the regulations. The CCPA regulation section 315 talks about the obligation by the business to respond and to treat global privacy control um, to as, as opt out. So it is not new under CPRA, although if you're looking at the CPRA itself, it was, um, it's called opt-out preference signal. It's mentioned 19 times. So CPRA absolutely um, is, is doubling down and um, has many more uh, rights and obligations that attach to the use of, um, to how to treat opt-out preference signals um, than the CCPA did. So um, this is, that's a quick overview um, of the different technologies and different rights and obligations um, under the CPRA and under VCDPA and CPA. I think that is the main part of our presentation. We're going to open up for questions. And if there are no questions, then I can uh, continue to provide some color on the enforcement, California AG enforcement, if people are interested. I'm looking out for questions. Thank you so much, Juan. We're going to pause here for a moment for questions, and we've got some in the Q&A. Um, meanwhile, I'm leaving the contact information for Juan and Kier up on the screen, uh, but I'll take this down in just a minute and we can just uh, have a conversation. So um, one of the early questions that I'd invite either of you to answer has to do with affiliations of companies and uh, perhaps companies that are affiliated at a technical level, but branded differently. Mm -hmm. does, this, uh, does this create a loophole of common branding to avoid CCPA or CPRA requirements? The question specifically was, how is the agency staying ahead of this, which I think we can't speak to, but maybe we can speak to how affiliations are treated in the statute. Yeah, I can take that question. Um, so the the business is a defined term under the CCPA, and it will continue to be under CPRA. In order to be a business, um, it needs to be commonly branded. So if it's not commonly branded, and if uh, the ownership of the companies, the affiliates are not shared, then it is not a business. Um, it is going to be treated as a third party. Now, how that how that distinction of what is a business versus a third party comes into play is when we're talking about these sharing. So a lot of the obligations will attach on whether you can share the data with third parties or if this is treated as a data that's consumed by the same business. Um, so uh, whether you are a third party or a business, CCPA and the CPRA apply, it's just going to apply differently in terms of how the data is shared between the affiliates. Great, thanks. Thanks, Yuan. I think that, that probably answered the question. And um, maybe another one for, for Kier or Juwan, there's a question about access requests. We mentioned that this is a core feature of both the CCPA and the CPRA and other emerging laws. Um, what's the level of granularity that the statute outlines in terms of what's expected? Now, some of this might be subject to rulemaking, but is there anything we can say about the granularity in access requests? I can mention a little bit based on some of the CCPA enforcement actions that we have seen from the California AG. Um, so in terms of the access response, you are required by CCPA to provide the categories of personal information that you have collected, but also the specific pieces of personal information. And I pause there because the word collect is actually defined. So collect is not just collect in a traditional sense that we think about, but if you are given access to, if you're viewing the data, if you're processing the data, it is still going to be in scope. So basically, I think you have to think about 
the categories of personal information that you are currently maintaining and processing and and also the specific pieces of personal information that you are you are currently processing it's a it's a better way to think about it because i think collect is too limiting of a word than what is intended now what is the level um, again it's the specific pieces so the categories would say we've collected social security number, for example, um, and the, the specific pieces will be the actual social security number. Now, when you are providing a response to the access request, however, the CCPA makes it clear that you should not be providing the sensitive data back as a response to an access request. So social security number specifically, and there is a, a section that outlines the number of what they consider to be sensitive data that, that the business should not be providing. So outside of those exemptions uh, where it's sensitive data, so social security numbers, for example, they don't want uh, to be sent, the, but you can truncate it. You can say uh, that, that you have social security number, but not provide the actual number. Outside of those exemptions, you should be providing the specific pieces of personal information, not just the categories. Now, um, Again, the law gets a little bit complicated. Theoretically, the consumer could ask for just the categories and not the specific pieces. But most of the times what we have seen with the, with the uh, businesses is that both the categories and the specific pieces are requested and therefore they need to be provided. Great, thank you. So we have a high volume. Uh, so th th thank you everybody for all these questions. And before I get to the next one, Juwan, actually there were a couple of follow-ups on the on the previous question about affiliations um, that I'll direct your way as a follow-up. Hang on, where are they? Okay. So for, for example, one person asked, um, does, does the affiliation, does the branding affiliation provision in CPRA mean that Nonprofits could legally collect and trans legally collect and then transfer data to related for-profit entities without any of the protections that the law gives to consumers because nonprofits are not included in the scope of the law. That's a really good question. Um, in fact, um, I have struggled with this question for several of our clients. So I'm not, uh, so I don't want to provide legal advice uh, because it is kind of a, a complicated question. Um, I think what I would point to for the purposes of answering this question in one minute is the look at the definition of business and take a look at the definition of service provider and the third parties, because those are defined terms under CCPA and CPRA. And so to the extent that CCPA and CPRA is not in scope for non nonprofit organizations, at the outset, it is not supposed to govern nonprofit handling of data. What we have seen is that certain service providers or certain third parties are collecting data on behalf of businesses. So we have seen that question come through. Um, and so we will have to work through exactly what that relationship is, who's doing the collection, what is the data collected for, for what purpose, and whether the CCPA or the CPRA would apply to that data collection and, and handling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Sherry, you've joined us again. Thanks, thanks for joining. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll include you in this next question. I wonder if any of our panelists would like to speak to IP addresses. So this is an interesting one. IP addresses, are, are they PII? Are they PII under CPRA differently versus CCPA? Um, and I'll just kick us off by saying, uh, you know, both laws cover persistent identifiers. And my, my quick take on that question is that IP addresses can be persistent identifiers, but are not always. Would anyone like to, to add to that? Well, Again, IP address is uh, actually enumerated. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, no, completely agree, Stacey. And IP address is enumerated as one of the categories of PI, uh, but it would have to relate to a person. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a related, yes, it would have to relate to a person versus perhaps an IP address of an institution. It would might be an example of something like that, right? Exactly yeah. right. Um, and then another, a guest asks, does precise geolocation include location derived from an IP address? 
Uh, that's a good question. So geolocation is actually a separate category under CCPA, under personal information, and it's uh, it's defined. So I would ask um, to, to take a look at the exact definition. It's also defined under CPRA. Um, so take a look at both the CCPA and the CPRA because CPRA is going into, um, it, uh, it's actually in effect, it's going to become operative as of January next year. Um, when you say derived, um, that's also interesting. The There is a separate category outside of geolocation there are a set category of inferences. So to the extent that you are making inferences, let's say, from a geolocation, or maybe you're taking the IP address and making references about geolocation, the inferences, um, any data that's derived from another set of data, that's also going to be personal information to the extent that it re relates to a natural human being. Uh, excellent. Great questions, everyone. Keep them coming. I'm going to direct this next one to you, Kier. There's a question that it says, uh, could you please discuss the mandate of the California Privacy Protection Agency? Um, is it a true regulatory agency or is its mandate narrower than that? Um, can you talk a little bit about the mandate of the, the new agency? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure what would make a, a regulatory agency a true regulatory agency or not, but I would certainly describe the mandate of the CPPA as uh, fairly broad. As we've heard, it will be uh, charged with uh, issuing new rules to implement the CPRA and also has authority, I believe, to update regulations that were enacted pursuant to the underlying CCPA. Uh, it's also going to be an enforcement authority, uh, so it will be charged with enforcing and uh, as some of those elements as part of that, it also has audit authority and is also, will also receive uh, risk assessments from uh, regulated businesses. It also, I believe, has a duty to uh, kind of publicize and uh, raise awareness about uh, consumer privacy rights uh, within California going forward. So I would say the mandate is pretty broad. We've been hearing information about how the agency is uh, currently staffing up. And I believe we heard at yesterday's board meeting that they're seeking to hire, I believe, 34 staff uh, under the budget uh, for this current year alone. I'll also add that what's interesting is that the California AG will continue to be an enforcer for the CPRA. Um, so the authority is now dual. The administrative enforcement is under the CPPA, uh, but the California AG will remain and retain um, the, the civil authority uh, so that the two agencies will both be enforcing CPRA starting January. Excellent. Thank you. I think we've got time for our a couple of more. Um, there's a question that I'm not I'm not sure I know the answer to, but, but possibly our panelists do that sort of follows on to the mandate of the agency question, which is that since the the new CPPA will share rulemaking duties with the California AG, who has the last word? Is it is no. that a question? That we can <laughs> not really. CPPA is going to be doing the rulemaking for CPRA. California AG will not be participating in the rulemaking. Right, right. Okay, clear answer for that one. That one's easy. Great. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, there's a question that, again, I, I similarly, I think we might not have the answer to, but it's an interesting one that I think the agency will will potentially provide guidance on or rulemaking on. Uh, which is around any practical differences between the opt-out of sale versus the opt-out of sharing. This was one of the big changes between CCPA and CPRA. CCPA required companies to comply with an opt-out of sale. CPRA extended that to sale and sharing. Um, but given the definition of sale being as broad as it is, is there, is there a practical difference that we can get from the statute, Juwan or Kier or Sherry? I don't. I think with the AG's recent interpretation that the use of third-party cookies is a sale, um, I'm not sure uh, where that distinction is um, lies. If that if that is going to be carried over into if those regs are going to be well, they're not regs. It's the AG's interpretation, um, but I think that most are proceeding as if that is a sale under CCPA currently, um, and I, I'm not sure. Uh, how that differs that much from sharing under as defined by CPRA. Yeah, 
I think that's right. Um, I think the one thing that we might think through, um, again, uh, you know, something to watch out for is that the definition of share is limited to cross-context behavior advertising. So that's what's different, I think, is that it kind of requires the, the behavior advertising piece of it, and it has to be cross-contextual, meaning across different brands. Sale does not have that distinction. Sale is any transfer of data to a third party for valuable uh, consideration. And so, you know, if uh, I think, yes, you're right, Sherry, um, the third party, use of third party cookies seems to be kind of the main focus from some of the California AG investigations that we have seen. Uh, but I think uh, from what I can tell, if we're staying close to the text of the law itself for CPRA, it's really kind of meant to be kind of across different brands. And that's where share is gonna be focused on, whereas sell is gonna be broader. Uh, and I didn't know what Jiwan meant when she referenced contextual advertising. We have a session on that. Well, you can learn more. <laughs> great, great closer. Sherry, I was just about to say, I think that's, that's about at our time, but I'm ending with um, a little bit of a crowd teaser, which is that there's a question in here about where do these CPRA sensitive data care categories come from? Uh, and we're going to be talking about that next week. And the week after that, we'll be talking about contextual advertising versus behavioral advertising and what, what those sorts of key terms mean and, and more in online and mobile advertising. Um, so as we as people file out, let me just share that schedule one more time and say thank you all so much for attending. We'll send the materials around afterwards to those who registered and we'll post them publicly. Uh, my, my pleasure to be able to kick this off with you, Sherry, and we're looking forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks so much. Thank you.